and two back to back 18 and a half hour shifts. So, I am just out of it. I've been asked to say something before yeah. the first song, so I'll give a two minute warning and, yeah. then, and, then, yeah. uh, and then after two minutes I'll come on and say that and then you'll do your first song. Great. So Unlikely. I'll just admit, if I do, I'll miss and one of you yeah. might have a John Six in the back of the head by accident, so apologies in advance. I don't know, I've got, I've got a splash I have to hit pretty hard, so you just... <laughs> I'm more likely to just drop out and go quiet than go wrong. <laughs> yeah, I just... Yeah, you'll just hit me go... And that's it, I'm out, I'm gone. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. This was supposed to be your two-minute warning. It's now a 30-second warning, I think. I don't think I'm on. I can't hear anything. Nobody can hear me. No.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yes. Morning, everybody. This is your uh, two-minute warning. Um, grab your drinks. Whoa. There we go. This is your two-minute warning. Grab your drinks. Come sit down, ready to worship. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We are about to start. Um, before, I, before we do sing our first song, um, I just want to say that um, the smart kids' children will leave as the first song starts, so that any minute, in other words. And then the preschoolers leave at the usual time during the first set of songs. So we're just going to worship the Lord now with the first song. Wandering into the night Wanting a place to hide this very soul This bag of bones And I tried with all my might but I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond And just when I ran out of road I met a man I didn't know And he told me that I was not alone You So, so long to my old friends, burden and bits and this, you can keep them moving, you ain't welcome here, from now till I walk streets of gold, I sing of how you saved my soul, this way with song. Get up, 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 get up,
up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. You pick me up, 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 Thank you. Please do take your seats. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to see you. A special welcome if you haven't been before, if you're a visitor with us. We're just uh, thrilled to see you and uh, do make yourself known to us. Um, we've got various notices to share with you, which are important. Uh, I'm going to ask Rachel to come up and uh, tell us about next week's service. Thank you, Ian. So next week is completely different. <laughs> That's what you need to know first off. Um, it's Remembrance Sunday, and so we are doing things very differently. There isn't your, the usual services at all, so there's no 9.15, and there's no 11 o'clock as we know it as it is at the minute. Um, because it's Remembrance Sunday, there's a parade through town uh, which goes to the Cenotaph for 11 o'clock, and they do an act of remembrance at the Cenotaph just at the bottom of Castle Park. There will also be an act of remembrance here in the church at 11 as well. So you can either go to the Cenotaph if, if you want to go there, or um, if you want to, to come into church for 11 o'clock, um, there'll be an act of remembrance here. Then we pause and we'll wait for the parade to come from the Cenotaph to the church with the flags and all the uniformed organisations, the Royal British Legion, the town council, the mayor and, and everybody. Um, and they will, and then they will come into the church, and that's all organised. The flags come to the front, um, and, and everybody comes in, um, and then we have a quite a formal service, which means that there's no children's work, um, and all of that sort of we, is on hold for next Sunday. So um, you're all very welcome to join us, and we'd love you to to come and be part of that. This is kind of our service to our community, to enable them to do Remembrance Sunday well. Um, so I would encourage you to come if you want to, although I do understand if you've got small children, you may not feel it's, it's the right service for you, and that's absolutely fine. I'm going to ask a big thing of you all, as regular um, part of our church here, is to make an even bigger sacrifice on that Sunday, and that's where you sit. To, we fill the church, it's about 350 people, and to be able to do that, we have to use every available space, which includes the War Memorial Chapel, which is this nice carpeted bit here. I will fill it with chairs, and if you are a regular member of St. Martin's, can I ask you to sit in there? There'll be a screen, so you'll be able to see and you'll be able to hear, and you'll have an order of service with the hymn words on and everything. But it just will mean that all the, the scouts and the guides and everyone like that can sit in the main body of the church and really feel part of the service. Um, and those of us who are here regularly... Um, can also be part, but just uh, just using that space. Um, if we don't use that space, we can't get everybody in. Um, and I really want to get everybody in. So next Sunday, just bear that in mind. Slightly different, well, very different, really, um, I, so that we can enable the community to do Remembrance Sunday. Thank you. Grace. Thank you. As the children leave, let's just celebrate how awesome it is that nearly 50% of our number are under the age of 18. Whee. And um, off they've gone. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Um, I'm just standing up very briefly to remind you that we have our Rooted Women's Day on the 18th of November. That's a Saturday. It's a whole day event. Um, it costs five pounds. But if five pounds is a challenge for you or for somebody you know, can you let us know? Because we don't want anyone to miss out on the opportunity to come and be with us and fellowship with us. We got um, two visiting speakers, Ruthie Gilbert and Jen Beale. Ruthie Gilbert is somebody I know through the Church Mission Society. Um, and they're coming to speak to us on Isaiah 58 verse 11 about being a well-watered garden. 
Those of you that have come before will know you get well fed. There's uh, wonderful opportunities to meet with God and good teaching. So I just want to encourage you to sign up because it's only two weeks away. And those of us that are organizing food start to get a bit twitchy when we don't know quite how many people are coming. So you can sign up online, obviously. There'll be a link in the, the what's on. Um, if you can't do it online, Rachel and I are here this morning and Nikki, but also um, you can ring the church office and let them know that way as well. Uh, we really want all the women of our community, our church community, to come together um, and have that time of fellowship and teaching. It's been special in the past and we hope it will be again in two weeks' time. My other notice is about pastoral care. Um, people ask us regularly, how do we do pastoral care as a church? Our main way of doing it is through our life groups and our teams. So if something significant happens in your life, and you're in a life group or you're on a church team, they will be the first people that come around you to support you. Um, but there is a pastoral care team, and you can refer to that. If you have know of somebody that you think would, would appreciate or would, is asking for pastoral care, you can email pastoralcare at smartchurchlisgard.co.uk or you can contact the office and one of the team uh, will respond to that need. We also have um, an ability to help financially. Um, it's limited, but there is an ability to help financially where we can. So again, if you're aware of somebody in need, it's so hard to ask for yourself. So do advocate on behalf of others and contact the church office or myself. Let us know uh, because we want to be a church that looks after each other well. Um, it's the responsibility of all of us, but we also have a formalized system of doing it so that nobody goes through the net and we manage to look after everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was, I thought that was wonderful. About 50% uh, of our congregation are, are children. Uh, I was in a meeting yesterday with um, uh, Anglican brothers and sisters from all over Cornwall, and so many of them meet in congregations where there are no children. So we really are very blessed here. Um, I just want to remind you of our church hall campaign. We have information about it over there. Um, the, uh, what we're doing, we want to refurbish St. Martin's Hall, if you remember. Um, it's a very old building, it needs a lot doing to it. We want to make it a net zero place in terms of energy and it's a fantastic resource for the church and the wider community. Um, we've got this goal of raising £50,000 uh, and we have this matched funding so that is limited in time. There are 21 days left uh, for us uh, to avail ourselves of matched funding. The, the, um, we have so far about £22,000 already with the matched funding but we've got a little bit to go to get that 50,000. So just encourage you to keep that in your mind and your prayers. If you can give, then please do so. You can do that online at Church Suite or lots of different ways that you can do that. So please bear that in mind. Um, and I just wanted to mention the Autumn Fair on Saturday the 25th of November from 10 till 3. I don't know if Linda is here, but um, there will be lots of stalls and things going on. If you want to contribute to that in any way, then see Linda Dean. Now I have the privilege of reading uh, two sets of bands of marriage. Um, I published the bands of marriage between Darren Joel Young of Liscard and Charlotte Louise Burton of Liscard. This is the first time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it. And for the third time of asking, I published the bands of marriage between Arthur Stephen Tamlin of Liscard and Pamela Jean Nichols of Liscard. And this is the third time of asking. Uh, if any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it. Now, I don't know if uh, either Darren or Charlotte are here today, but I do know that Pamela is here. Uh, Pamela, give us a wave. So it's great to have you with us, Pamela. And uh, we are going to pray for you right now and, and all the couples, the both couples um, that are planning uh, this wonderful covenant before God uh, to be married. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you for Arthur and Pamela 
and for Darren and Charlotte. We thank you for their desire to uh, come together in marriage and to celebrate that before you and before uh, it publicly before others. Lord, and we pray your blessing upon them. We pray that you bless them as they prepare with all the details that are to be sorted out. But even more than that, we pray that you'll be preparing their hearts for life together, that they might do that with you in your strength. Lord, bless them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right, we are going to worship God together. But before we do that, we're just going to take a moment just to quiet our hearts. We've had lots of busy, busy things going on and lots of noise. Let's just try and calm down. Let's focus. And I'm going to read to you Psalm 100. So pin back your ears and just uh, use this to help prepare your hearts. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. That's what we want to do this morning. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations.
praise to God for who he is. So mighty, so holy, so wonderful. Just shout some things out. Such an awesome God, so mighty, so holy, so wonderful, such an awesome God, so selfless, so generous, so faithful you are, such an Oh 
just wonder as we're singing that uh, no place I would rather be whether the real force of that is sinking into our hearts we're not talking about being in the church building we're talking about our lives no place I would rather be we're saying Lord I accept that you are at work in my life and all the things that are happening somehow you have a hand in them And what we're saying is, Lord, I am content with what you are doing. That's not a fatalistic acceptance. It doesn't mean to say we don't strive uh, to get out of situations and to be better. But it is saying, I trust you, Lord Jesus, even though maybe awful things have happened that I don't understand. I feel like I'm in a pit and I don't know how to get out. But the Lord is saying, trust me. Let's just sing that again. No place I would rather be. And as we sing it, we say, Lord, I'm content with what you're doing in my life. And I'm trusting you to work that out. Amen. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love. No place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. Then here in your love, here in your love, there's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. Then here in your love, here in your love. If you'd like to take your seats. We're going to move now into uh, a time of worship and prayer together.
So Lord, just as we make ourselves aware of your presence and quieten our hearts, Lord, we ask, Spirit of God, that you would come. Lord, we know you're here, but we ask that you make your presence felt. Lord, that you would encourage our hearts to believe that you're a God who wants to be worshipped and who answers prayer. So let's pray together. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When we look at the night sky, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place, when we consider the awesome scale of a universe of billions of galaxies, we marvel at your creative power. When we consider the infinite variety of your creation, the amazing sophistication, the intricate balance of the natural world, and when we consider the wonder of our own bodies, Lord, we marvel at your creative genius. Lord, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And when we think that you, God of such awesome power, entered our world in human form and submitted to cruelty and death on our behalf, Lord, it takes our breath away. And what can we do, Lord, but worship you? We worship you and we thank you, Lord. Lord, we recognize that you had to do that to rescue us from our own sinfulness. We take a moment now to reflect on ways that we may have fallen into wrong ways of thinking or speaking or doing and there are things that we ought to have done that we have left undone. Lord, we claim your promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's take a moment in our hearts just to absorb that and to say thank you, Lord, that you have wiped the slate clean for me. I stand accepted, welcome in your sight, Lord, and clean. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Lord, you have promised that if we ask in your name, you will do whatever we ask. Help us now to bring our requests in confidence and faith that you keep your promises. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing here at St. Martin's. Lord, we rejoice at so many children, Lord. Thank you so much. So many other things that you're doing here, Lord. And we continue to pray that you would lead and guide us during this time of transition as we seek a new vicar. Lord, please will you continue to give strength and wisdom to all of us and especially those involved in leadership at this time. Lord, may we be a church that is truly led by you. And Lord, we pray for the person that you are preparing even now to be our next vicar. We ask that you prepare the way for them and, and lead them clearly. And please strengthen and guide all those who are involved in this selection process. And Lord, we want to pray for those who are suffering in the world at this time. Lord, our hearts break as we see some of the scenes that we're witnessing on the news. We bring before you all those who are suffering because of war in Palestine and Israel. We pray that ways will be found to protect civilians and to bring the aid to those who desperately need it. And Lord, we pray for peace. Soften the hearts of those who are hardened by hatred and fear 
Help them to seek the good of all, not just themselves. Raise up those who will speak for peace and cause them to be heard. Above all, we pray for a long-term solution that will provide justice for everyone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we pray for all of your people who are caught up in violence and war across the world. Protect all those who own your name, Lord Jesus, and provide all that they need, as you have promised to do. We pray especially for Christians caught up in war in Ukraine and in the Middle East, in Sudan and other areas of conflict around the world. Lord, encourage them. Strengthen them. Fill them with your spirit. Cause them to shine for you in these dark places for your glory. Help us to remember them and to support them in whatever ways we can. Lord, we thank you that you hear the prayer of faith. We ask it all in your name and so that you may be glorified and honored through it all. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Mm. Amen. I'm going to ask Mark to come up and... Um, just going to pray for you, Mark, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Mark, Lord. We, we thank you for the wisdom that you've given him. We thank you for his faithful service of you through so many years, Lord. And uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say to us through him. We ask your blessing upon him, Lord. Give him great confidence in faith, knowing that you are going to speak. And Lord, we ask that you give us open, honest, willing hearts to hear what it is that you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good, thank you. Well, there's... Uh a difficult passage today in some ways, Matthew 24. It's about the end times, the second coming of Christ. It's about destruction of temples in Israel and so on. So uh, a subject that a lot of people have a lot to say about. And uh, whereas some Bible passages are pretty straightforward, you know, love your enemy, don't repay evil. The evil is not really open to interpretation, is it? Certain passages are a little bit more open to, well, I see it this way, I see it that way, and so on. We've got one of those today. But the first thing to encourage you on, two things. First of all, there's a lot of what they call typology in the Bible, typology. So Abraham's life was a type of Jesus. He was not equivalent to Jesus, nor was David, of course. He committed adultery. But his life was pointed to as a type of Jesus. You look at um, Moses in the desert, striking the rock, living water flows out, pointing to Jesus being the living water. You see the bread of heaven come down when they're wandering through the desert on a daily basis. That's a lesson to ourselves as well, you know, that we can't live on yesterday's bread all the time. It goes moldy. Got to keep this relationship with Jesus going, fresh bread. But Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And so, so much in the Old Testament points to Jesus. It's, it's, there's sort of typology. It was relevant for then, but it's also relevant for today, and it'll be relevant in the future. Look at the book of Judges. The book of Judges is just us, in a nutshell. The book of Judges is people mess up. They sin. They do stupid stuff. They get in a fix. They cry out to God in their distress and go, God, help us. God delivers them. They go, God is great. And then they get, life is good again. They forget about God, and the whole cycle goes on again. Isn't that you and me sometimes, even if not in massive ways? That's me, I'll be honest, sometimes. Things are going good. My desire to pray goes down a little bit. As soon as I hit a rocky period, there I am on my knees. So all this typology is going on. The reason I'm saying this is because this passage, some people say, it's all happened already. Other people say, none of it's happened. It's all into the future. That's called futurist. The other one's called preterist. Personally, I believe it has happened. It's still happening. And it will happen in a big way when Jesus comes back 
for the second time and wraps up history. One other thing I want to say before we get into this passage is that the Bible, we should have full confidence in it and its ability to be true. You see, you look at, we've mentioned the war, we've prayed for the war in Palestine right now. We've seen some terrible things. But if you go back to Genesis 16, you see the start of it. And it's just continued, and likely it will continue, because it's caused by a mess. Humanity is a mess. That's why bad stuff will just go on, because all of us are deeply flawed. But if you look at that story of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Hagar and Ishmael, you'll see all the seeds of what's going on today. You see, Abraham and Sarah were promised a child. But like a lot of us, they doubted God. They thought, oh, we better take things into our own hands. So Abraham, Sarah says, why don't you sleep with Hagar? That must be the way we're going to get this baby of promise. And so Abraham does sleep with the servant, Hagar. They have a baby called Ishmael. Insecurity comes into Sarah. She goes, mm, I'm not really happy about this. You wouldn't be, would you? My husband's doting over another woman and her baby. She the Bible says, mistreats Hagar. In fairness, it says she mistreats Hagar. Then, 14 years later, they have their own baby. The one that I would say that you could argue was the original one of promise, but that's hugely contentious. And she has Isaac. 14 years later, it is recorded in the Bible that Ishmael who, by the way, God also visits Hagar and gives her a promise that she will be the father of a, a mother, or Ishmael will be the father of a massive group of people, as indeed Abraham is. The Arabs and the Jews. There it is in Genesis 16. Mistreatment of Sarah of Hagar, but also Ishmael is thrown out of the house for his persecution of Isaac. And do you know what the word is to describe that persecution? Hamas. It's in the Old Testament 70 times, and every time it's used in the context of violence. I'm not getting political here. I'm just saying how confident we can be in the Bible. It's a Hebrew word, Hamas, means violence. When God destroyed the earth, when in Noah's time, it says the earth was filled with violence. Do you know what the word was? Hamas. That's why God destroyed the world. And there are numerous other examples where that word is used. So whatever we think about that mess which has been caused by sin and on both sides and is still being perpetuated by sin on both sides, I think one thing we can say that God doesn't like is Hamas as in violence. It's never been the answer, is it, for God to uh, do that sort of stuff. And so there we go. The Bible is just incredible. It's pointing to, and even in this passage today, as we get into it, Matthew 24, we see things concerning the destruction or proposed destruction of the temple of Israel and so on. And when the disciples begin to ask Jesus about it, he gives them some answers that I believe were true for them back then. They're true for us today, and they'll be true in the final coming together of all of history when Jesus comes back. We'll have a look at it. Have you got an image up there, by the way, of the, I don't know if it ever got through there. Well, that's today. That's rockets into Israel. Have you got the old one? Another one? Uh, well, there was meant to be, you can turn that one off. That was just to show it's continuing. But there is a picture, an image of the overthrow of the temple in AD 70, okay, which just shows the armies surrounding Israel in AD 70. There's also biblical prophecy saying armies will surround Israel in the very end. It's incredible, isn't it? It just goes on and on and on. And we're going to look at this passage, Matthew 24. So it says this, um, Jesus was... Uh, left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. They were really impressed with the temple, and, and you would be. It was the size of five football pitches. The walls, the blocks were essentially white and crispy. It was adorned with gold, so much so that when it was overthrown in AD 70, and Jesus says, you might be impressed with this building, but I'm telling you that in there's going to come a time where not one stone, not one stone will be left on another. That's quite a statement, isn't it? That's quite a prophecy. It's not, oh, it, 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 it's going to lose its power or something. There will not be one stone left standing on another. 
And the rumor is, and I can't prove that this is true, that when the Romans did eventually come in and destroy that temple in AD 70, there was so much gold in the temple that when it burnt, the gold dripped down between the cracks of the stones. And so people took every stone apart, like you would if there's gold there, or the chance of gold, just like when they did in the Wild West. Uh, there's gold, and every single stone was pulled apart. And certainly today, every stone is pulled apart. So Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attentions to its buildings. And he said, do you see all these things? He said, truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Well, this came true in AD 70, okay? So those who say this is all in the future are wrong right away. It has happened once. A lot of the people who believe that at the end times um, there will be a new temple built, a third temple, and that will be the place where, as we see in chapter 15, the abomination that causes desolation will stand against once more. It's quite complicated. I don't want to get too bogged down in all the theories, but then, a bit later, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, overlooking the temple, and they're all there again, the disciples take this opportunity to come up to him privately and say, tell us, when will this happen? Good question. When, when's it going to happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? Obviously, second coming, because he's there right now with them. And of the end of the age. I mean, they're actually asking three questions. Three big, big questions, aren't they? When will the temple be over? That's relatively straightforward, unless it goes on. And secondly, what will be the signs of your second coming? And what will be the, the sign of the end of the age? Jesus answered. This is how he answered. And I believe this was true for them back then, it's true for us today, and it will be true in the final summation of the whole of civilization, okay? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. Deception is the major, major battle against us as Christians, indeed against the whole world. It started right back in the Garden of Eden, didn't it? uh, Sorry, did did God really say that? Yeah, in the Garden of Eden. Did, did, Did God really say that? The serpent says, you sure? It's exactly what goes on today. No different. Nothing changes. Deception. The devil is called the father of lies. I mean, everything and every strategy of the enemy against the church and against true believers is deception. Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. Apparently, there's a bloke out in Russia now up in the hills who's claiming that he is is the Messiah. And he has some followers. There's been loads over history. Um, But I would suggest that when Jesus talks here later on and he says... Every eye on earth earth will see the second coming. The four corners of the earth will witness it. I would say that guy's probably not uh, Jesus coming back. But anyway, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Has there ever been a time in history when there hasn't been wars and rumors of wars? It's, It's just the nature, isn't it, of humankind. So even this week, we see a war in Israel and Palestine. And we hear of rumors. I mean, are Turkey and Iran going to join with the Palestinians? Is, is America, they've sent their ship out there? Rumors. Rumors, wars, rumors of wars. And so it goes on. But he says, see to it that you're not alarmed. Not that we're blasé about war, but we go, come on. This, there's always been rumors of wars from the beginning of history to now. This isn't by itself the sign that I'm about to come back. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Again, there's always been, hasn't there? Storms. You have people today that are very alarmist on the climate. You have people who are very denying of climate change. You've got very great extremes there. And there's something in the middle. Yes, it's always happened. Yes, it is happening in now. And yes, it will happen in the future. The question is, will it happen more in the future? There's a good chance it will do. And so all of it makes sense, in a sense. And so he's going, but don't be alarmed by this. Just expect it. This is the nature of the world we live in. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Now, I've not had a baby. I'm looking at a lot of ladies out here who have. And uh, I don't know what it's like to have birth pains. But I've seen my wife, and she suddenly goes, Ooh, I think, I think the labor is coming. Ooh, like that. Sorry, but 
But you know, wow, this is going to be a fairly little unpleasant episode coming up. And as a man, you know, we're heroes, aren't we, in that situation? But anyway, not. Uh, The lady is there with birth pains. But when Jesus went to the cross, it said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He was going to go through intense pain knowing that it was going to win people like you at the back, people like me at the front, people everywhere here. And he's going, for that, I will endure this terrible pain because I know that there are going to be millions and millions of people who will be won for heaven because of the joy that's set before me. I'll go through that. Doesn't a lady do that in childbirth? She goes, this is going to hurt. This is going to hurt. But when that little boy comes out, in our case, he was called Malachi. Oh, it was worth it, I say, wasn't it, from him? <laughs> She goes, I'm not sure. No, but the point is, for many years of joy, and hopefully your children bring you joy. I know some families, just like this conflict in Israel, some things just go crazy, don't they? But the plan is that the child brings joy. And so the pain, the labor pain, is bringing something beautiful. I love this analogy here. Later on, Jesus, we're not reading the whole passage. We're only doing the first 14 verses. But later on, Jesus talks about, see the fig tree. You know, when you see it beginning to bud, you know something's going to happen. When the woman goes into labor, you know something's going to happen. But I love this analogy because it's going almost like, even if the pain gets worse, even if it gets intense, particularly just before Jesus comes back, we should be encouraged to know it's going to birth something absolutely wonderful for us as believers. But he says before that, and he's talking to his disciples back then, it was true then, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. Nearly all the disciples were put to death, weren't they? I think it was 11 out of 12, I might be wrong, but a lot of them were persecuted and put to death. So it was true then. It's also true now. Christians are being persecuted in various countries in the world, And they always have been. Atheism had its go against Christianity with, you know, the communist regimes that imprisoned believers. I read Richard Wurmbrandt's book when I was a young Christian. Um, Islam has persecuted Christians. Um, Other beliefs and so on have persecuted Christians. It's going on all over the place now. And even now in England, it's harder than it was 20, 30 years ago. When I was at school, I wasn't a Christian, but we used to mock the Christians. But I would put it pretty much in banter. I'd go, ooh, you're Christian, woo, and have a little laugh. But it was nothing more than that. Now, in Britain, it's gone past that. You can actually lose your job quite easily if you hold traditional biblical views on a whole range of issues. It's enough to get you fired, ostracized, cut out. Things are changing. It's harder. Definitely harder and more costly to be a Christian. But many people don't have the courage or guts for that. And so it says, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. I've seen this. I've seen this over the last 10 years. It's very disappointing every time you see it. But you see people who, who walk away. Oh, sorry, my thing's gone. Uh, people walk away. And a lot of it, for whatever reason they give, I, I would suggest often it's just a lack of courage to be a Christian in this day and age. Now, I don't want to say that's the case in every case, but in many cases, I think the cost of it gets too much. Ooh, I could lose my job. I'm walking away from this. And it is the same in Ceausescu's Romania and Eastern Germany when Wurmbrandt went to prison. Many of the Christians were happy to betray each other and dob each other in to save going to jail. But then many of them obviously did and stood firm and went to jail. Just as a matter of encouragement, by the way, When Wurmbrandt left that jail after years being in, terribly treated in jail, and he went back and the doors of the jail were opened and he walked out, this takes some believing, but he said it was like I had been up the mountain with Jesus, like Moses was. It was like I was so close to him in that jail that I knew I could never, ever expect to be as close as I was to Jesus ever again. So on the one hand, he went out from the persecution, very happy. But on the other hand, he knew that that trial had produced an intimacy with his God that was so beautiful and so precious, he might never experience it again. That's to encourage us that when the going gets tough, if we dig in, it can be the most beautiful moments, even in the midst of trial. Hence, see to it that you're not alarmed. 
Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Most, not everyone. There will always be some great people on this earth. And the love of most will grow cold. And I've seen that in this last two weeks in shocking ways. On both sides of this war in Palestine, on the one hand, you can have people that are so pro, say, the Israel side, they don't really care about the children and that getting bombed on the other side. Well, they deserved it. What did they expect? That's quite hard and callous. It shows a lack of love. But similarly, on the other side, I've seen pro-Palestinian demonstrators ripping pictures of hostages off walls, of little babies that have been taken in, in hostage, as if it's irrelevant. How, how hard does your heart have to get when you can do either of those things? Not care about babies getting killed on one side and not care really about babies getting taken on the other side. Let us be people who don't let our hearts ever get that cold. Try and keep, allow Jesus to keep your heart soft, to never be happy with suffering, to never be happy with, with torment of people and in their lives. But as the increase of wickedness grows, the love of many will grow cold. I've seen that so much in the last few weeks. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. We've got to stand firm. They had to. We have to. And in the future, people will have to. And then, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, many people would look at this passage and say, the reason Jesus can't come back just yet is because the gospel hasn't gone to every single tribe and tongue and unreached people group in the world. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not certain that's really what it's saying here. But at the same time, there's a good point here. It's like that's a sign that the Great Commission has been fulfilled and Jesus can return because the gospel has gone everywhere. But it was also true back then. If you remember under that persecution, I'm thinking about Acts 8, when the persecution broke out, they were expelled or they fled to where? Samaria, Judea, and the ends of the earth. The persecution forced those early disciples to take the gospel. And where did they take it? They took it to Africa. They took it to Asia. They took it to Europe. They took it everywhere. And so it could be, again, someone said, this has already been fulfilled. The persecution did happen. They were martyred. They did send the gospel out to the corners of the earth. Or we could believe in it in a way that is still being done and will be done even more. There you are. That's the 14 verses I've had to speak on. But if you go on even to the next line, and I'd love people to go home and read this. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers and so on and so on. Haven't we just seen similar scenes just recently? Terrible terrible stuff. It has happened. It will happen. Evil has always been in the world, and it will happen again. I would love to try and talk on the abomination that causes desolation, but that'd be another 40 minutes, wouldn't it, or 30 minutes. So finally, in conclusion, I think what we need to take from passages like this is that the main verse, I would say, see to it that you're not alarmed. We're people who've got this Bible. Just as I said at the beginning, it, it's, nothing is surprising to God. And if we're in the Word of God, again, we'll be far less surprised by things that are far less thrown about, far less tossed about. When we see, wow, the Bible did suggest that that might happen. The Bible did suggest that that has happened. That's always been the way. Yes, it was the way then. Yes, it is now. Yes, and it will be in the future. And I would just be careful of getting into either one of two extremes, as always, as believers being absolutely obsessed with the end times and thinking of nothing else. There's big growing groups of what they call preppers now, Christian preppers who are preparing for Jesus to come back. And so they stockpile loads of goods, build themselves a bunker, go out in the middle of America and wait for Jesus to come back. I mean, that's an extreme position because the Great Commission said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all nations, baptize people and, and, and do the job. And so by taking yourself right out, I don't know that that's a, a middle ground healthy point of view. But similarly, there will be people who are very scathing as soon as anybody mentions any form of eschatology.
eschatology, anyway, you know the word, eschatology. Uh, any form of end times, people, oh, shut up about that. And there's a very unhealthy view then. The Bible seems to say, as he says in the next few lines, nobody is going to know the exact hour. Nobody's going to know the exact day. But when I do come back, everyone will know it. But he also seems to say, just be aware. See the fig tree. See things. Be interpreting the word, world through scriptural terms so that you won't be surprised. So that you're ready. And I think that's probably the healthiest view. And see to it that you're not alarmed. One last thing I want to say. I've been a Christian 30 years. When I first became a Christian in 1980, I was in a Pentecostal church and people were talking a lot about the mark of the beast, um, the end times, the rapture, all this stuff, 30 years ago. And uh, it did two things to me. It sort of was like, ooh, it's a bit scary, all that stuff. So it caused a little bit of fear in me. Oh, so what? I'm going to have a mark of the beast and if I don't take it, I'm going to get my head cut off. I remember having nightmares about it, actually, as a young Christian. And so um, 30 years on, we're still talking about it. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not 30 years further on, and I believe we are 30 years further on, and a lot of things are sort of moving together on a global sense. But look, somebody said to me this once. They said, God does not give you grace for your imagination. He gives you grace for your actual circumstances. So say that again, all right? God doesn't give you grace for all the things that you can imagine happening, all the bad things. So whether you today or somebody worries about your possible health issues, not your actual ones, your possible ones, whether you're someone who worries about your possible poverty in retirement, not actual, you haven't got there yet, but you're, you're, you're worrying that I could, I mean, I might, I'm, I'm, my house might go down in value, and I'm, all those imaginations, similarly, with the Antichrist and all this stuff, you, you can imagine a hundred scenarios. What would I do if, if I had a bullet to my head? And my, I would, would, I, would I deny Christ and be with my children and wife? Or would I? You can imagine everything. God doesn't give you grace for that. And so you'll just worry. But he will give you grace for the actual circumstances. And I bet there's people here who can testify that when they did have a hard time, God was there, wasn't he? God is faithful. So that's what I want to finish on. You can talk about the end times. You can talk about wars. You can talk about rumors of wars. You can talk about all this stuff. God won't give you grace for all the, <gasps> but he'll give you grace if and when things come your way. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that it's so far reaching in the way it covers every single issue that we face personally, but also that the world faces. And we recognize that the only hope for us as individuals is Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can save us, but also we recognize he's the only hope for the Middle East. And we see today approximately two or three percent of Jews following Jesus, two or three percent of Palestinians following Jesus. Oh Lord, that there were 50, 60, 70 percent of each of those nations following Jesus. What a different set of circumstances we would have. So we pray for peace out there, but we recognize that the peace is most likely to be established by people turning to you. Bless, Lord, that area as best you can. And bless us, we pray, as best we can in the sense that we position ourselves sometimes to receive blessing more than other times. Help us, Lord, to be even a bit as faithful to you as you are to us. And we thank you that time after time we've been unfaithful, but your faithfulness never ends. So we thank you and we give you praise. Amen. Amen. Just respond in worship.
with no point of reference. You spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planets fall. If the stars are made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you made. Every burning star is signal fire of gray. If creation sings your praises, so will I. And God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken, oh nature and science, follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath, evolving in pursuit you said if it all reveals your nature so will I I can see your heart in everything you say every painted sky a canvas of your grave if creation still obeys you so If the stars are made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans are your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sum of all our praises still fall shy, then we'll sing again a hundred billion times. God of salvation, you chased down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created, light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Where you lost your life so I can find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in heaven. Every part designed been a work of a color. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. I can see your heart a billion different ways. 
every precious one and child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them so alive, like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Well, I wonder what we're going to take from this service. Just, uh, am I on? Yes? Do be seated for a moment, please. And I just wonder what we're going to take away from this service. We've heard a wonderful message, a challenging one. What, we, what are we going to take away from that? That God is the God of history, that he's known from the beginning what's going to happen. That persecution of believers is to be expected, that God is with us, that his grace is for our reality, not our imaginings, that there is much evil in the world, but the source of it is the evil in individual human beings. So where do we stand? Am I part of that evil or have I found salvation in the Lord Jesus Am I seeking to live for him in his power, in his strength? Because that's the only answer ultimately for all the world's problems. It's as each one of us truly turns our hearts to him and owns him as our Lord and seeks to be led by him, seeks to follow him. So let's each one of us just be determined in our hearts that we will be followers of Jesus, that we will receive his grace, his enabling to live for him. If you would like prayer um, on that topic or on anything, but do come join us in the corner over there. We'd love to pray for you. Um, we're going to end with one more song in a moment, but before we do that, I'm just going to uh, speak the Lord's blessing over all of us. In the words of the, uh, the blessing of Aaron, from number six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. So one more song and then we'll be done. Great. Let's finish with some energy and some dancing.
my joy is restored and what's broken is here so i won't fear the evil because the shadows ain't real and the darkness can't hide what your light can reveal you're leading me down you're leading me Yeah, we've been fighting, but it's time to feast. The devil is a liar, he's gonna wash me. And Jesus is alive, and he fights for me. Jolly goodness and mercy walk beside me. Jolly goodness and mercy walk beside me. Yeah, we've been fighting, but it's time to feast. The devil is a liar, he's gonna wash me. And Jesus is a liar, if any fights for me. Jolly goodness and mercy walk beside me. Jolly goodness and mercy walk beside me. Yeah, we've been fighting, but it's time to flee. The devil is a liar, he's gonna wash me. Jesus is alive, if any fight for me. Surely goodness and mercy walk beside me. Surely goodness and mercy walk beside me. Leading me down where the water runs to, where my joy is restored and what's broken is healed. So I won't fear the evil, cause the shadows ain't real and the darkness can't hide. Put your light you're leading me down where the water runs to where my joy is restored and what's broken is healed so i won't fear the evil because the shadows ain't real and the darkness can't hide but your light can reveal you're leading me 